So we're going to talk about titles. If you want to think for a minute and post some ideas in the chat, what should your title do? What's a title do for a paper or a poster or a talk? Why do you write a title? What's the function of the title? I'm going to open my chat here so I can see it. So I've got one, draw attention. I had a question about the recording being available afterwards. It will be available. I'll try to say more about that later. Call attention should be catching, capture attention. Determine, readers should determine if they're interested in the talk. Catch the general attention of the public. Draw attention to the right audience. Communicate the subject clearly and general idea of what the talk's about. Entice the public to attend. Again, we're mainly going to be talking about scientists talking to scientists. So these are titles that are, you would give if you were posting an abstract in Botany 2020 or if you were writing an article for a major scientific journal. Short glimpse of what is included inside the contents. Communicate the subject. These are all great ideas give results, be informative. So all of, all of these things are right in, in one way. There are still better titles than there are other titles. But if you look at main, most, many titles that you're going to see at this conference, for instance, or if you go to most journals, all of the things that you've said are the important functions of titles aren't met by the titles. Titles are doing something else, usually. Now, I'm saying you're right. I think the reasons that you've got there are right. You want to attract the attention and you want to summarize your results, especially summarize your results. But look at the titles and you can think about what they're really doing in those titles that we see. So I would say that a good title should be sim what we would say a simple, surprising, and concrete. This is pretty abstract right now, but we're going to use these ideas of a simple, surprising, concrete title when we look at some titles in just a second. Simple means, you know, terminology is fine. Complex terminology is okay or um, jargon is okay for a scientific audience. They're going to understand the jargon. So I'm not saying get rid of the jargon. That's all right in scientific titles. But don't overdo it. If you could say the same thing simpler without the jargon, maybe you should. If you need the jargon, it's a name of a gene or something like that. And that's important for your research. You need, it needs to be there. It's a scientific talk. Surprising. Well, you know, all research really should be surprising. Why are you doing research if you're not finding something new? Surprising means what's new about your research. Your title should convey to the audience what you have done that no one else has done before you. So they can look at your paper or your abstract or your poster and say, oh, I'm interested in that because there's something new here. And they can tell that from their title. You don't want them to have to read down halfway through the paper to find out, oh yeah, they actually did do something new here. It's not just rehashing the same thing. You want that to be in the title. Concrete is the least concrete of all of these terms, but it's easiest in a way to understand. You want it to be specific. You want the title to tell the audience what, is the, what the paper's about as, in as much detail as possible. We'll look at some examples, and I think these things will become more clear. So you can keep these ideas simple, surprising, and concrete. Eventually, as you understand these ideas, you'll just think about writing clear titles and titles that are not clear. And you won't have to go through this process of saying, well, is this title simple? Is it surprising? Is it concrete? You'll just be able to say, is this a clear title or not? Let's look at some titles. OK, so all of my examples come from science. They come from recent, recent issues of science. If you look on the Science Magazine's website, and I assume it's going to be the same in Nature, but I haven't checked there, you're going to find a lot of titles, especially in the last year, that clearly communicate the major result of the paper. Here's an example. Bumblebees damage plant leaves and accelerate flower production when pollen is scarce. I mean, a title right there tells you what the major finding of the paper is. And you're going to know if you want to go into that paper and get the details. And because they put it so clearly, it's pretty interesting, which means it's surprising. That's 
And that's what you're going for. So all of those things you wanted in a title, this kind of title does really well. And if you look then at the abstract, here's the abstract, we can see that actually that same point is made in the abstract. And they're going to make it in the main part of the paper too. So this is what you're going for in a title. And as I said, look at the go to the Science Magazine's website and start looking through the titles. Now, I only look through plant titles. So I put a search term in there and said, you know, plants only. That's all I wanted to look at. And I found in the last year, I'd say more than 50% of the titles are like this. They are clear, simple, surprising, concrete titles like that. So it's really changing fast. I say it's changing fast because if you go back to 2019 and you do the same search, you'll find less than a third, maybe 20% of the titles are like this. So people are catching on to this. If you look at the Botany 2020 website, well, you look at the Botany 2020 website and you tell me how many titles are like this. So it's something we can learn. And it's something I think that is very important. We're going to look at three titles. Here's the second one. Root branching toward water involves post-translational modification of transcription factor, and there's a transcription factor ARF7. So there's jargon here, lots of jargon. But it still is a pretty good title. It talks about the, what the result is. It talks about there's post-translational modification. You've got an idea of what, the, what these guys did and for their work. And it talks about the gene that's involved. And so, um, or the transcription factor that's involved. And so if you were interested in a transcription factor, you would know that this is a paper that you want to read, or if you were interested in root branching. And if we look at their abstract, we can see again that this same result is right there in the abstract, except now they mention auxin here. Now, I'm put all these big abstracts up here. I know you don't have time to read them, and I'm not expecting you to read them. I'm just putting them there to show you that these highlighted portions are there. But I want to now highlight another portion of the abstract. We look down at the bottom of the abstract. They say something else here. So SUMO, and you have to look up in here, small ubiquitin-like modifier proteins. So SUMO-dependent regulation of auxin response controls root branching pattern in response to water availability. So that's actually a little more general than the title that they used. And would, if they included this kind of information in the title, make the title more attractive to a larger audience. So they are obviously looking for people, or they thought they were looking for people who are interested in this transcription factor. But there might be other genes that are sumer dependent regulation, have work on this um, small ubiquitin-like modifier protein. And so you could think about changing the title to something like this, using that second part of the abstract. Sumo-dependent regulation of auxin controls root branching in response to water availability. It's still simple. It's still pretty concrete, not as concrete as the first one, not as specific as the first one, but there's a trade-off there. And it's surprising, right? I mean, it's not something I would have expected. And so it makes me want to learn, know more about this and know more about this research. Let's look more at one more title. So evolution of carnivorous traps from plantar leaves to simple shifts in gene expression. It's pretty good. It's not completely clear to an evolutionary biologist what they mean by evolution here, because that word is used in a lot of different ways. But it's clear that we're talking about carnivorous traps. So you can think about a number of different species there. There are simple shifts in gene expression. Well, that's interesting. It's an interesting topic that you're getting simple shifts and you're getting these complex traps being made. Let's look at their abstract. So here's got a couple things that now come out in the abstract. They're dealing with a model. So they're probably not actually doing um, the, the genetic research, I haven't looked at the paper in detail here, but they're saying they're printing a model that accounts for the formation of these two types of leaves through this change in gene activity. So we can use that to think about how we might write the, rewrite this title. So carnivorous traps can be produced from plantar leaves through simple shifts in gene activity or gene expression. 
it's a little more general. It takes out that world evolution because to an evolutionary biologist, they're not really dealing with evolution. They're not doing any kind of phylogenetic analyses. They're not looking in, a con in evolutionary context. They're not looking at related species. They're looking at a single species and they're making a model of how carnivorous traps have develop can develop in that. So it's really, to me, it's really a question or a paper about development. So we've taken out the, the term evolution from this. The word can is a little bit problematic here. And I don't know what you would want to say there, but this is a, there's a very interesting issue in this, at, at this point. They did a modeling study. So they don't know 100% that this is always going to work. It's not, we'd have to dig into the paper in a little more detail to see if they've really tested this at a molecular level um, in, the, in this species, Uticularia is what they're working with. So I put the word can in there as kind of a weasel word to soften their, their results. If they thought that they were really, if they, they thought their findings were really result, if they thought their results were really robust, they could just say carnivorous traps are produced from plantar leaves through simple shifts in gene expression, which would be much, a much stronger title. So when you're evaluating your title, you've got to think a little bit about how confident you are in your research. You don't want to misrepresent your research by writing these simple, concrete, surprising titles, but you want to write a title that's going to draw people in. 